Hello and welcome to this edition of Bakul Talks. Now, as most of you probably know, Bakul Talks is live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, in which the, in the first season that started, uh, it is about the Nobel Prize winners of 2020. You know, just to go over uh, the reasons for starting Bakul Talks, assuming that there are also many people today who have joined for the first time, you know, uh, we started Bakul Talks as kind of online public lectures, which are topics of common interest, on topics of common interest. You know, you don't have to be a student of a particular discipline to be interested in this. But yes, these are topics of common interest for any curious individual. So we assume that anyone who's curious to learn, to know about the world, about what is happening in the world of knowledge, should be curious about them. So. These are talks at the same time that, as I said, you know, you don't have to be a student of the discipline. So which means that it should be intelligible and interesting to any teenager. Any teenager should be able to understand it. So they are on esoteric topics like auction theory today, but in a language in which it is intelligible and interesting. But at the same time, which is insightful to intellectuals. So that's the idea behind Bakul talks that these are public lectures for everyone. For example, I am a student of literature. Now, I normally do not follow much of economics, but I'm curious to know. And that is what we found that a lot of people know the significance of the Nobel Prizes, know that this is significant work which has impacted mankind and so impacted us, but we don't really know much about it. And we often think that it is probably beyond our comprehension. And so we don't really make that effort. So Bakul Talks is here to demystify these seemingly uh, out of reach intellectual ideas and to make it intelligible to us and interesting to us. So that's the idea behind uh, Bakul Talks. And this is an outreach activity of the Bakul Library where I'm sitting here. Uh, the Bakul Library in Satyanagar, Bhubaneswar. Uh, we used to have many such talks and lectures at the library when the library was open. But in this pandemic, the library closed. And so we are doing online engagements like Bakul Talks. Of course, other than Bakul Talks, there are other activities like storytelling from around the world, which happens every Saturday, again, live on the same channels. You know, Of course, this is live today on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, but the storytelling from around the world happens on Twitter, not on Instagram, uh, every Saturday at 9 p.m. This Saturday, though, I would like to mention, those of you who are not aware of it, this Saturday is Diwali and it is Children's Day. So we are doing it at 4 p.m., not 9 p.m. So that's a speciality. And, you know, if you're not a child also, I'm sure I would urge you to check out the earlier videos. You can go to YouTube, the Buckle Foundation channel on YouTube, you know, youtube.com slash Buckle Foundation, you can check it there or on Facebook, uh, the videos section where you're seeing this. You can check out the earlier storytelling videos. It's very interesting. So every Saturday, we travel to a different country with one of the finest storytellers from that country who also introduces the country and the culture to us. So one of these Saturdays, we travel to Mexico to be a part of the Day of the Dead Festival. And this Saturday, we're traveling to Indonesia where Diwali is also celebrated in a big way. And they have their own Indonesian version of the Ramayana, which the storyteller is going to tell us. So that's very interesting, you know. So we have many versions of the Ramayana, and there is an Indonesian version, which we get to hear this Saturday. So I would definitely in invite you, urge you to check it out this Saturday, and of course, the previous sessions. Uh, every Sunday, we have Robbie Bar Gopobar, which is storytelling in Oriya, again at 9 p.m. This continues, of course, this Sunday, also no change in timing. It's only because it is Diwali that on 14 November, Children's Day, which is also Saturday, we're doing it at 4 p.m. So that's about the storytelling. Now coming back to Bakul Talks. So this library, the Bakul Library in Satyanagar, many people have been asking me about this library. Now this library, of course, is known more as a library for children and it is one of the best libraries for children in the country. But it is also a wonderful library for adults. So those of you who are watching this, you know, so these books are not for children. These books are for grown-ups, you know, thrillers, there's serious fiction. We also have a section on the Nobel Prize winning authors. And not only that, there is a new extension of the Bakul Library, 
the LKM Center, named after LK Mahapatra, who happens to be my father, in whose house we have set up Bakul. Now, my father was an anthropologist, so with his personal collection and books donated to Bakul, which includes a very good collection of books on economics, we have set up the LKM Center, which is a library for on the social sciences. You can just see some images of the library here. It is right inside the same premises, uh, the adjacent building. So this is the library, you know, it's a cozy little, mostly we can go on the next slides. Um, books on, these are academic books on sociology, social anthropology and economics as well. Next. So here you have three books by Nobel laureates, you know, Amartya Sen, Abhijit Banerjee, two of the Indians who won the Nobel Prize, Gunnar Midral, next. And here is one of our volunteers who has been reading. So you can come and check out this library as well. Now I'll show you some of these books. Uh, we can exit. So these books, you know, by Amartya Sen, by Abhijit Banerjee, are the books of our library that I was talking about. So those of you who are students of economics or, would, or by students of economics, that do not necessarily mean that you are studying economics for a degree. Those of you who are interested to, you know, explore economic thinking, you know, you are welcome to come down. And uh, you know, so today we are talking about the Nobel Prize in Economics for 2020, which has gone to um, Robert Wilson and Paul Milgram, uh, Milgram for their work on auction theory. Uh, I won't say more about it, but you know, something that I also discovered when I first heard auction theory, I thought, well, because as a student of literature and someone who's engaged with the arts, we normally associate auction with you know, high end art auction or others. But then I realized that wherever bidding is involved, it's auctions, you know, whether it is, you know, I'm trying to sell my stuff on OLX or I'm trying to get a best deal for my phone. So, and the Nobel Prize winners this year have significant contribution to our understanding of auctions as well as devising new auction formats, which is what I read. But we have one of the finest persons in the country today to talk about this, Professor Jeevan Rampal from IIM Ahmedabad. He teaches economics there and he's an expert on behavioral economics. And uh, auction theory is something that he has significant research on and he will introduce it to us. So let us welcome Professor Jeevan Rampal. And as you know, the format, uh, after he uh, gives his lecture, you are welcome to ask questions to him and he will respond to them and then we'll take it from there. Welcome Professor Jeevan Rampal. Thank you very much for agreeing to come uh, to this session. I know that, that you're in the middle of a class. Thank you very much once again for that. Over to you. Uh, hello, Sujit, uh, and welcome to the viewers uh, and listeners of Bakul Talks. I hope I'm uh, audible. If I'm not, please uh, let me know on this chat. Uh, 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 so uh, this is a, a very, uh, 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 very nice uh, uh, day for us theorists, people who study game theory, and in particular auction theory. Uh, it was a very nice day when. Uh, uh, Milgram and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for this year. Uh, uh, so just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, uh, you know, uh, just because we are in India and talking to uh, talking to Indian students uh, at various uh, junctures of their uh, education. Uh, uh, so so this is, uh, uh, you know, one can think of uh, Rabindranath Tagore as the first winner on, uh, uh, for, for English poetry. And C.V. Raman in 1930 for Raman effect dealing with the scattering of light for physics. Uh, Hargobin Khurana won his Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine in 1968 for genetic research. Uh, Mother Teresa for the Nobel Prize in 79. Uh, Subramanian Chandra Shekhar in 83 for physics again with uh, William Fowler. Uh, and then uh, uh, Amartya Sen won uh, the 1998 Pro Nobel Prize in economics for his contributions to welfare economics. In fact, it, his textbook uh, uh, dealing with social choice theory, how should you know individual preferences be aggregated to make a social choice? We see it every time, right? When we do elections, we have been seeing it uh, for Bihar elections, 
for United States elections, uh, elections and uh, various of the, so the, uh, the Indian way is very different from the American way. They have the electoral, electoral college, uh, 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 whereas uh, for the chief minister, it's a different, a prime minister is different. Uh, so, so Amartya is saying, analyze the properties, like what gets captured in such a, in a process with the electoral college, what gets captured in some other systems for electing, uh, 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 electing representatives or electing plans for 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 you know education development etc. Uh, because we all have different ideas of like this road should be built like this, that bridge should have gone from here to there. Everybody has different preferences regarding how society should be managed, how should resources be allocated. So how do we actually take a decision for collective uh, uh, lead for people? And what they're saying wrote fantastic uh, uh, textbook and papers on uh, how to aggregate choice. And then he also analyzed poverty uh, very carefully uh, and exactly what causes famines and poverty. Uh, theoretically, how can we understand what what's the what are the root causes and what can we do to change that? And his work with Jean Dres there is is remarkable as well. And so he got uh, his uh, the Nobel Prize in ninety eight for his contributions to welfare economics. Uh, 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 in twenty fourteen, I think Kailash Satyarthi. Uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize along with Malala Yousafzai, uh, and uh, in 2019, uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and Michael Kramer won the uh, again the Nobel Prize in Economics for their study on how to reduce poverty using RCTs, randomized controlled trials. So the idea there was that, uh, well, you know, how this how to reduce poverty is such a you know, huge problem. Uh, uh, how do we actually go about designing policies to, uh, you know, counter uh, 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 poverty? So, so they went at it. They said that, well, let's see if we can get some clear answers for bits and pieces of this problem. Let's not always try to capture the to solve the entire problem at once. Let's try to solve it in bits and pieces, which we can manage, where we can see that this scheme A makes a difference in, for example, uh, 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 education of children, right? So one of the studies that they conducted was in Mumbai and Badodra, where they provided these uh, teaching assistants to students uh, who were uh, giving need-based sort of lessons to students. And they found that really educational outcomes were far better for such children. Uh, on the other hand, Michael Kramer had studied uh, uh, you know, providing books and food and meals in rural Kenya, schools in rural Kenya, and that did not sort of affect the performance of uh, the average student uh, as much as they would have liked. So uh, the idea, for example, so the one of the so that's one of the main contributions to say that look, we need to think about teacher quality very carefully, and this has uh, you know informed several government policies in several countries, uh, uh, which which have really started taking the question of teacher quality very seriously. So uh, similarly, they, they have they have they conducted studies for uh, providing uh, heavy subsidies for preventing health healthcare. What if I can eat a deworming medicine and not have the problem entirely, rather than have the problem and then uh, having to go to the hospital, which is costly for me in terms of my health and my lost income, uh, uh, and it's just far cheaper for me to just use preventive uh, uh, steps. But people somehow, when there's a little bit of cost attached to a vaccine, a cost attached to uh, uh, you know, uh, some uh, medicines that can prevent the disease, uh, we uh, do not make the right choice. Many of us do not make the right choice. We should go for that preventive uh, vaccine or, or medicine, but we don't. And it was found that it's not just a uh, it's not just a function that we don't believe that it's going to be effective. We actually uh, uh, are responsive to the costs of of that preventive uh, healthcare. So uh, they uh, so they promoted heavy subsidization of vaccination uh, of of uh, of, uh, of other medicines that can be preventive, and that's been shown to be very effective as well. So uh, these were the Nobel Prize winners: Amartya Sen and Abhijit Banerjee from India with a very strong Indian connection in within economics. Uh, and so this year, coming to this year, uh, 
we have Robert uh, 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 Wilson and Paul Milgram as the Nobel Prize winners. As I said, very exciting day for uh, uh, game theorists and people who are auction enthusiasts. In fact, I'm going to. It was very helpful for me because I was about to launch the auctions course in in IIM Ahmedabad because uh, uh, it's of great importance to businesses. Uh, in fact, it's very hard to find someone who for whom it's not important because it's important to the government. Even they sell spectrum, uh, uh, how, can they make a lot of money from it? Can they may ensure that the product goes into the right hands? Uh, uh, a lot of that requires a very cleverly designed options. Um, so uh, let me just try to outline you know, what are the uh, contributions that they make. So let me talk about auctions a little bit first. So I don't know how, where you saw auctions first. I remember seeing it in some Bollywood movie where, you know, the person uh, couldn't repay the, uh, the the bank and the bank is seizing his or her property and then auctioning it off. And it's a very sad event. And people are uh, bidding openly for, let's say, a table or a bed. And they're saying, you know, whatever, 100 rupees, two th not 100 rupees, like 1,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees, and so on. That actually is a particular auction format called the English Open Outcry Auction. Uh, so the question is, you know, uh, how do you choose which auction to use to, to sell products? What are the various properties that they have? Well, it so it, happened, it so happens that there's actually a long tradition behind analyzing this. Auctions are basically selling mechanisms, right? So I want to sell something. Uh, I want to uh, ensure. So typically, auctions uh, are designed to have two main aims. One is that they should be revenue generating. So if I sell, I should be able to make the most money I can from uh, uh, the sale as an auctioneer. And the second thing is that it should go to someone who values it the most. That is called efficiency, that it, uh, it is in the hands of somebody who values it the most. So, <clears throat> uh, 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 so there are different types of types of auctions. So, you know, and, and, and what, uh, 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 so, so as I was, as I was saying that, uh, so think of, you know, some, uh, painting from a new artist that you're going to, uh, bid that that's being, that's been sold. Uh, uh, now it's very hard for one to set up a market just for you know a few paintings to be sold. Uh, we know that if we want to buy chips, then we can just go to a store and buy chips. Because chips are being supplied in huge numbers, bought in huge numbers. There are marketeers. Everything's happening in huge numbers. Paintings, you know, by new artists are very rare. So uh, uh, relatively to chips, at least, right? So uh, 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 so how do we sell them? So uh, one way is to uh, uh, just assign it randomly. One way is to uh, uh, to auction them carefully. Okay, so uh, auctions have been shown to be very uh, helpful in generating more money for the person who's selling, and often also very uh, good in terms of ensuring that the person who values it the most gets it. So, uh, uh, so imagine let, let's start with a simple case of some new artist's painting being sold. Uh, how do you sell them? So there are several formats. One is that. I make everybody bid and whoever bids the highest. Uh, uh, so I, let's say I make everybody bid silently and write their bid in an envelope and submit it to me. And I open the envelopes one at a time. And I find that X person has the highest bid. I assign that person uh, uh, the, the, the painting and make him or her pay the uh, bid that they submitted, right? So that's called the first price sealed bid auction. There's another uh, 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 type of auction called the second price seal bid auction, which is a little bit technical, so I won't I won't get into that. Another is the auction I was just describing, which is English open outcry auction. So where uh, uh, people literally uh, uh, sit around and they bid some, they 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 say some bid for uh, the painting, and uh, uh, as the uh, price goes up. Uh, 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 you know, some of the bidders drop out, uh, and then in the end, there's only one bidder left. And when only one is left, that person is assigned the object at the price at which uh, everybody else dropped out. That's called the English open outcry auction. Similarly, there's a Dutch auction which begins with uh, uh, high prices and then going lower and lower until someone raises their hand and says, I am willing to buy at this price. Okay. Uh, that's called the Dutch auction. 
So, uh, 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 so there are these, all these different auction formats. And so, so these were the classic ones because, for example, Dutch auctions were used to sell flowers. Uh, 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 we know English auctions are, you know, as I said, been, been shown in movies and, and auction houses like Christie's and so these have been using them. Uh, government tenders, so for example, uh, when when you when somebody bids to make a bridge or a road, they submit uh, using the first price sealed bid auction, right? You submit your bid that I will be happy to make this bridge in uh, you know ten lakhs or something, uh, and there the it's a reversal of the first price in which like the person who submits the lowest one wins, so it's the lowest bidder uh, gets the gets to make the government. Uh, uh, to, to implement the government project, right? So that's the famous L1 rule that the government follows. Uh, so obviously auctions, you know, also have a certain, why do governments follow this? Auctions have a certain sense of fairness to it that here are the clearly well-defined rules and they're the same for everyone. And so this is an open, completely open process of allocation of scarce resources. So uh, one of the earliest winners in, in auctions was William Bickery, who, uh, analyzed all these four auctions, so 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 Dutch, English, second price, first price, and he came up with this very puzzling uh, 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 foundation that in settings where my value for the product has nothing to do with your value. So again, that's the setting where we can talk about paintings by new artists. I am sitting and evaluating it. I don't know what your value is. I am uh, I draw I look at it and I draw my own value uh, estimate for it. Right? And so my value estimate is presumably has very little to do with your value estimate. And in such a setting, uh, he found that the four auction formats are pretty much equivalent. They raise the same amount of expected revenue. The good always goes to the person who has the highest value. So uh, this was a quite a puzzling result that these auctions have all these different rules. How come the same expected revenue is coming out? So it uh, uh, that was sort of organized by uh, Roger Meyerson and uh, and others, Riley and Samuelson also rate of growth very nice paper. But Roger Meyerson uh, in 20, 2007 won the Nobel Prize in economics for his contributions to game theory and and, and in particular also to auctions. Uh, uh, so so basically uh, 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 then you know enter. Uh, uh, because this is again, this is this is the, all this analysis was being done in a setting where my value has very little to do with your value. Uh, however, one can easily imagine scenarios where we all have some amount of common value for the object. So, what is an example? So, uh, of such an auction, well, think of something like oil drilling rights, right? I want the rights to drill uh, oil in a particular uh, location. And we are all bidding for the right to obtain that uh, tract of land and to get drilling rights in that for that tract of land. Yeah. Now, of course, the um, what are what's going to be our value for uh, uh, bidding in this is is very is very much a common value scenario, right? Because there's a certain amount of oil in that tract of land, and we all value that oil very very similarly. Yes. So there's a one correct value in some terms of the uh, oil contained in the tract of land. And so that's more common value settings, right? So uh, more towards the common value setting. Now, there's a, there can be elements of private value that my extraction cost may be different from yours. So my extraction cost, I follow just a different technology. And so they have very little to do with your cost. So my, your net value may be different from my net value. But the petrol uh, or, the, or diesel or all the oil products in that tract of land are all the same. Yeah, so so it becomes a common value setting. So how should you bid in this setting? This uh, a very very complicated question was answered by uh, uh, Milgram and Weber in a in a classic paper with the help of earlier work by Robert Wilson. So uh, uh, Wilson and Milgram played huge roles in 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 solving how to bid in this setting. In particular, they figure out that. If you do this such an auction uh, uh, on a first price basis, which is that uh, the person who bids the highest for the tract of land gets the drilling rights, then there's a very, uh, 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 very uh, uh, it's it's very dangerous in terms of it can cause a winner's curse. So this is 
the idea there is that the winner actually winner gets the tract of land drilling rights but actually ends up making a loss so why does this happen so the idea is very simple let's suppose 10 of us are estimating what is the value of this tract of land and somehow i have the highest value right and that's why i bid the most aggressively that's why i get the object but i forget that i have the highest value maybe i am overestimating the value right because why do i have the highest value 10 of us are trying to estimate the true value of this but i am the one who values it the highest and i am the one who bids it the highest and when i find the amount of oil i and un i understand that it was my bid was actually the highest and my expected valuation was the highest because i was the one overestimating the amount of oil in that the tract of land the most so this uh, uh, wilson for example showed how to should rational bidders who are like perfect you know think like computers and can calculate all the calculations that are needed uh, how they will sort of bid optimally to avoid such a winner's curse right uh, uh, and milgram and weber solve for this in more general settings uh, uh, and then uh, uh, and then subsequently it's been tested many many times actually by behavioral economists and it's been shown that this is a very serious problem uh, so uh, to boil it down even more simply for you, uh, uh, so imagine uh, uh, you know ten people uh, drawing randomly some numbers between zero and twenty. Okay, uh, what is going to be the highest number drawn? It's going to be a bit nearer twenty. But as we increase the number of people drawing some random numbers between zero and twenty. Uh, if say a hundred people draws random numbers between zero and twenty, the uh, person who draws the highest will almost always be twenty. His number drawn will almost be twenty. So the idea is that even though we are randomly trying to estimate the value of where is it between zero and twenty, person who's actually the most optimistic is to the extreme upper end of uh, uh, where actually the value would be. All right. So that's just a simple example. It's very hard to sort of explain it to you. Uh, in um, simpler language, but uh, 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 if ever you come to IMA, we'll do some experiments and I'll show how it works. Uh, even now, my students all fall, fall prey to this. Uh, when I do the experiments, they uh, make losses whenever they win in such settings when there is common value component is there. So they uh, Milgram and Wilson solve for this very uh, essential model in, in, within auctions. And then you know uh, one of the biggest reasons they have gotten the prize is that they have also uh, figured out how to uh, uh, even though they have uh, how to auction some 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 things like uh, radio spectrum right so 700 megahertz band you want to auction some some spectrum uh, 800 megahertz band you want to auction some spectrum and so on how should you auction them the problem is very difficult because. Uh, uh, suppose we divide India into some territories. If I get Bihar territory, then I'm on UP territory. If I get this 700 band, then some more of the 700 band is more maybe uh, uh, better for me than getting some 700 and some 900 and some 1200 megahertz band, etc. So the, there are many problems of complementarities and substitu substitutabilities, right? So Bihar territory and UP territory is maybe more than more for me. More, more beneficial for me than just Bihar territory and some uh, 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 and say Karnataka territory. Okay, so um, because I don't have as much uh, uh, sort of coordination becomes a bit harder between separate far away territories, right? So how should you assign territories? Uh, 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 how should you assign objects which have complementarity, substitutabilities? IPL is a good example. If I have two very good batsmen already and I'm bidding for the third one, it's not the same as when I don't have two very good batsmen, now I'm bidding uh, my first two batsmen are medium quality, and now I'm bidding for a third good one. If I have a good bowling attack, what is the value of batsman? What is the value of a bowler? What is the value of an all-rounder? They're all changing all the time based on the package I have. So this is a very tough problem to how to sell in this setting, uh, how to get the maximum revenue from uh, from from the bidders, or how to assign objects to the right person. And in fact, before Milgram and Wilson came. The spectrum, radio spectrum, and uh, electromagnetic spectrum allocation would just be done on some lottery basis. 
or sometimes something called as a beauty contest. They would say that, okay, so you please come to the government authorities, various companies, and present, you know, how, why do you value this so much? How will you service customers? And the, the process was very subjective. You had to make many presentations, impress the government officials. And of course, the scope, so scope of corruption existed in this whole process. Uh, so uh, 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 that was, uh, you know, something torturous for everybody involved. Then uh, the lottery process is not much better. What if you randomly assign it to some uh, 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 some firm that is operating out of their own bedroom, and uh, they win the auction to service uh, five states in India in, in terms of their uh, FM frequencies, etc. Uh, 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 then they won't be able to service uh, uh, the customers properly. Maybe they won't be able to afford the uh, fixed cost, the the towers, etc. That are necessary to relay signals, etc. So how do you do this? So it's a very tough problem. And there were very, in all honesty, very poor solutions in, in existence before uh, Milsen, Mils, uh, Wilson and Milgram uh, stepped in. And in 94, they designed the, uh, the, the FCC spectrum in the United States uh, using a pretty complicated auction. But it had very nice results in terms of uh, it raised a lot of revenue in hundreds of billions of dollars far more than that had been raised for uh, uh, for the government uh, uh, in, in the other, other processes that I mentioned. And so much more revenue for the government. And furthermore, it went uh, the efficiency in the sense that people who would actually, firms that would actually service to customers were the ones who were getting this. Uh, and so uh, uh, the outcomes all around were much better. There has been some criticism that uh, if you allocate spectrum so uh, in such a costly manner, then firms are going to pass this along to customers, the co extra cost. But that is, uh, in my opinion, quite unfounded because firms anyway try to pass along as much uh, uh, or try to get as much profit out of the customers as possible. So uh, if in the process, government can make more revenue and help fund uh, uh, programs for poverty alleviation, and for infrastructure development, then it's all the better. So uh, the, the corporates are going to price uh, uh, high anyway. The, uh, the only sort of consideration is that does it raise concerns regarding competition? If the licenses are so costly, then maybe only very few firms can enter. And for example, we have this telecom sector in India uh, right now being reduced to just basically two firms. If Vodafone cannot uh, 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 negotiate a deal with the government, uh, so there is a danger of that, and so that is something uh, one has to be mindful of. So it's not just so the 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 whole topic doesn't end as soon as you select the right auction. Uh, the topic only sort of uh, you have to be mindful that there are all these other considerations. Uh, you cannot just have the right auction and everything else is wrong. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, in India we have had a lot of policy flip flops. So uh, even if you if the government say does an auction. Uh, if the bidders don't believe that this policy or this auction setting will be actually followed through properly, or, uh, uh, then when they are bidding, they may not be so confident about their bid. So this is something that's happened. Uh, unfortunately, in 2012, uh, 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 spectrum allocations were cancelled by the Supreme Court, uh, which again, so that has a reputational effect that uh, next time when the government does an auction, uh, should I believe them or are my spectrum, uh, uh, you know, purchases going to be cancelled? Uh, so uh, auctions cannot exist in the absence of uh, well uh, uh, oiled policy and a consistent policy stance, because uh, auction rules uh, need to be believed by the by the bidders, and they need to be confident that the government is going to uh, follow through on its word. Uh, so, uh, so Milgram and Wilson have been very instrumental in solving very important problems. As I said, uh, now we know what is a winner's curse, how to avoid it. Because of them, uh, a lot of it is because of them. Uh, we have They have act actively designed auctions in settings where actually, theoretically, we still don't know what to do. Uh, Milgram did have what is called a linkage principle that the auctioneer should reveal as much information about the product as he can. Uh, and that's why English open outcry auctions, that the one that I discussed in front of about the movies uh, that I saw first, is actually a pretty good auction. Uh, 
but still in, in ipl or you know in allocating allocating spectrum what's the optimal strategy is very very tough to solve yet they have been they are so uh, uh, good at analyzing strategic uh, uh, considerations that bidders face that they have designed very successful auctions moreover their students and their collaborators like al roth uh, and uh, 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 who got the nobel prize with lloyd Sh shapley uh, have sort of looked at markets other than just uh, markets where we can trade uh, goods for money for example for example kidney right for kidney exchange how do you design kidney exchange it should not be that if i have more money i should get kidney before you do so uh, uh, how to design exchange uh, uh, of kidneys because kidneys uh, uh, don't of don't always match between uh, uh, just the relatives so there needs to be some kind of an exchange that so that i get the kidney that i need so how do you do that uh, uh, so uh, uh, similarly how do how to set up online rating uh, matching things how to match you know wants needs to actual supply when there's actually trading is not allowed in terms of money changing hands uh, that has also taken a lot of learning from the, the work done in auctions by milgram and wilson so their contributions have been in many many areas which are where we which are actually being uh, 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 affect us in daily life in fact when we do uh, when you search a word on google or uh, yahoo or any search engine the first few spots that you see uh, uh, which are which are often marked as uh, sponsored so how does something get the first spot how does something get some firm get the second spot how does some firm get the third spot these are also actually auctioned off in something called as a generalized second price auctions again they have also learned that those auctions designs have also learned a lot from the work done by Milgram and Wilson. So, uh, so this has been shown to, as I said, increase revenue for the seller, boost efficiency. The person with the highest value gets the object, and in general, uh, have a fair process that is e easy to implement as well. So uh, uh, we see this all around us uh, when you switch on a TV, you listen to the radio, when you Google something. You're seeing the results of uh, the work done by Milgram and Wilson and, and many others. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, Suji, yeah. can you? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, so yes, uh, if any of you have questions, please type in the comment box on YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram, wherever you're doing it. And we will take those questions. Uh, for the next 10-15 minutes, but as you're seeing it, please do not forget to like, share and subscribe uh, to our channels and please share this video as you're seeing it so that your friends can also, you know, even if they cannot, they miss the live session, they can always see it later. So please definitely uh, like and subscribe to our channels and share this video uh, and leave your comments uh, in the comments box. But you know, uh, Professor Ampal, you know, it was very interesting the way you made the connections between uh, IPL, of course, from the filmy, the one that, you know, the, uh, you know, banging the uh, the thing. And uh, and I was quite curious, you know, I never thought that online dating could also be governed by auction theory. And I was just thinking, you know, our traditional swayamvar in that sense, seems like an auction as well. So could you elaborate a little more about, you know, one understands that if there is, you know, you're trying to make profit or maximize your financial returns through an auction, but when it is not financial, mm -hmm. how does it work? Does it work similarly? So uh, there have been many such, so Al Roth is the pioneer here. So I will not spend too much time uh, on this, uh, but the idea there was how much should, you know, the men pay, the women pay on such markets to for online dating profiles uh, to to be in there, uh, 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 and so uh, 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 so I agree that this Soyambar now that you are saying also sounds like an auction to me, where yeah. uh, it just came to a mind while you were speaking. Yeah, but it's a very simple auction. Everybody is being displayed on uh, in front of you, and you choose the best option in front of you. And again, the I guess the kings were all okay because. Uh, uh, it's an open process with well-defined rules, and so in that sense, it's uh, it's it, it takes something from auctions. 
so i think we have some we have a question here from sarthak uh, yeah. what is the difference between auction and tender so sarthak as i said auction and tender very similar for auction a tender process that the government follows right now is the l1 rule which you all must know uh, where uh, if i want to build a bridge for the government i have to say that i will build it in some amount of money and the person who promises to do it in the lowest amount of money subject to technical evaluations etc gets the uh, tender to do so this is exactly like the first price auction but just reversed so first price auction you bid uh, when you are bidding for a painting the person who says i am going to pay you the highest amount of money for this painting that is the person who wins the painting and takes it home and pays the money right in this case you are saying i am going to do this project for you you pay me and the person who uh, promises to pay the uh, so take the lowest amount that is the person who goes home with the tent so it's very much similar to the, it is the first price auction but just reversed rather than the highest bidder winning the lowest ask in this case is the one who's winning okay um, i just wanted to add something to that you know uh, because nowadays of course in governments also they seem to add a quality component to the l1 so how does that work so it is not just the lowest bidder but you yeah. try to ensure a certain quality yes so uh, so it's subject to subject to that's what i said so subject to bidders clearing a technical uh, 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 evaluation of quality or in in some cases uh, uh, they only invite bidders who they know can do the project and so they will uh, they will have a scheduled list from which they'll take the uh, they'll invite bidders so they so that that forms more of more more often than not a kind of an entry rule uh, because uh, then that establishes uh, transparency in the whole process because otherwise if we add quality uh, checks then it can become a little bit uh, 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 opaque the whole process now uh, uh, one thing i want to say is that in this tender process precisely the winners curse problem arises so the person who often promises to make the bridge for the cheapest has underestimated the costs associated with making a high quality bridge and therefore we often see these delays and renegotiations among the and lawsuits within the government and the body that is making it so that is the say, that's precisely the problem that happens so uh, but the problem is that you know l1 rule that the lowest uh, person will make it that is just politically more palatable for 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 people right however many countries in the west have moved to some other rules which is like we'll take the average bidder and give him or her the project because that person is actually avoiding the winners curse and we won't have to renegotiate and go to law courts etc etc with that person and the overall cost of doing if you account for lawsuits etc will actually be lower so other governments have started moving in these uh, uh, innovative directions but it is a bit hard to sell politically so uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's this is a uh, you know huge contribution of these uh, uh, wilson and milgram and other auction theorists yeah because normally i think in the popular perception particularly when tenders come and governments come one imagines that one uh, bids the you know goes for the cheapest but at the same time then the quality suffers you know you yeah. compromise yeah, yeah. So quality, again quality can also suffer because uh, the bidder has underestimated He's, he or she is suffering from winners curse and if they cannot renegotiate then they cut costs so how do they cut costs by compromising quality so this is a huge reason we we see renegoti renegotiations and poor quality infrastructure so uh, uh, this is something to be mindful of but very few people are aware of this mm -hmm. uh, so let's see this question is it good to have so i'm just asking to have options on historical things Or should we always have give historical things to museums? Okay, like arts and art artifacts. Right, right. So uh, you know, second price sealed bid auctions have often been used to sell historical collectibles uh, that people from far, far away submit their bids. Um, yeah. So Prayash, I am actually answering your question right now. So second price auctions are used in collectibles. Uh, uh, you see them on ebay auctions as well uh, you see them uh, on 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 uh, uh, so the adwords that i said the who gets which spot is is basically a generalized form of second price auction so second price auction how does it work suppose uh, uh, sujit some submits a bid of 100 uh, 
I submit a bid of 80. Then Sujit gets the object, but he pays my bid, the second highest bid, 80. Okay. So uh, it is actually one can show that in such an auction, uh, Sujit has no incentive to report anything other than 100. He is actually doing the best he can by reporting simply his true value. So it's a good auction in the sense it gets the true value of the object out of people. All right. But that is also why it is it can be a little bit of a curse because people don't want to reveal the true value of their of how of how much they value something. Uh, so as I said, it's used in uh, in slightly modified forms. It's used in uh, ad ad spaces in uh, on Google etc. Uh, and uh, it's used uh, for collectibles uh, when people are sitting far far away. Now for the sixth grade question that uh, that question of should they be just given to museums to enjoy publicly? This is a very good question, and I don't think auction theory can answer that question. That is something more to do with political economy and thinking very carefully. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, it's not always about who can pay, but uh, 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 who, who, you know, maybe the public deserves to see some historical artifacts and not just certain people who can hang it on their walls. So I think it's a more, it's a broader question uh, and a very nice question. But if I don't think you mentioned politics. Yeah. Uh, because the debate about Indian artifacts being in British museums. That's right. Things like that also come in. That's right. Maybe we can't bid for them, you know, but. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I think Kimoy yeah. wants to want some recommendations on books to understand this domain better. Yeah. So there are very nice books. So in fact, Paul Milgram has a very nice book called Putting Auction Theory to Work uh, 2004. Uh, no, but that's a, that can be a quite a bit technical. Vijay Krishna has a book, uh, uh, again, on auction theory. Very nice book. But these, see, all these books build on game theory because uh, the baseline of this whole and Milgram and Wilson are also have tremendous contribution in game theory as well. So uh, game theory knowledge is required to understand auctions. It is a co co complicated world in terms of because I, what should I bid? Should I bid? You know, uh, 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 how should I take into account my 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 competitors' bids? How should I, as a seller, how which auction should I choose? These questions are very tough to sort of solve. Some of them actually have not been solved and do not look like they'll be solved at any point in time. Not not even new. Doesn't it doesn't look very promising? So uh, it is hard, but it is rewarding in terms of uh, applications and. Uh, real world differences that you can make. So I think uh, I like to, if you want, you should check out Milgram and uh, uh, and uh, and Vijay Krishna's books. So those are like the uh, standard books in uh, in analyzing auction theory. Could you, in fact, uh, our next question is also linked to game theory. Uh, could you? Uh, so he's asking where game theory is applied in behavioral economics and connection between. The RCT experiment. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so game theory is so. In fact, uh, uh, Al Roth, who was, as I said, the Nobel Prize winner, and uh, one of my advisors, John Kegel, and others, were actually playing leading roles in getting the new design that Milgram and Wilson uh, had come up with implemented for the spectrum auctions, because uh, policymakers were rightly very concerned that. Here you are coming up with these very complicated auction rules. How will people actually play? So they call this sort of role of uh, experiments as a wind tunnel uh, 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 role that they played. So just like how you, for an aeroplane, you don't just send it into the sky to see if it if it flies or not. You first analyze if its aerodynamics are working fine in a wind tunnel. So experiments and how do people actually behave in these auctions were actually very important in figuring out uh, which auctions will be successful, what are the pitfalls that people can sort of suffer? Because they, we at the end of the day, the bidders are human, and we have cognitive limitations. And for example, uh, a good, very good example is winner's curse, right? The theory said that this is a pitfall that you know uh, theorists should be careful of. Precisely that pitfall, everybody fell into. So that's one of the most robust findings. Even if you take very very experienced bidders. And put them in a slightly novel setting, they again fall prey to winner's curse. You see winner's curse happening in auctioning of books, you see it happening in au auctioning of petroleum tracts, and everywhere, right? So, 
the link between behavioral economics and game theory is that game theory is designed for uh, uh, for the most part assumes that players are completely rational they are sure everybody else is rational behavioral economics says no 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 people are not completely rational there are very precise ways actually systematic ways in which they depart from rationality let's try to understand that let's try to design policy being mindful of that and uh, uh, rct experiments as i said have been done the leading one as i was discussing uh, benerjee and duflo's uh, experiments uh, on uh, uh, preventive care right so uh, if you just make vaccine uh, costless uh, there is a certain surge in demand for it clearly that is not just an economic consideration because the benefit from taking the vaccine are far outweighing the costs even if the vaccine is a little bit costly but when you make it zero there is the zero price effect that kicks in every if something is free then you just feel that much more enthused to actually take it up so that rct actually showed that how important it is to make vaccines costless and so in fact i think it's very important even uh, here right in in the covid times that we get a free vaccine uh, not just some with some minor cost etc because even a minor price on the vaccine can deter people and that's purely a behavioral response uh, they see that there's some price i let me avoid it zero price let me take it so uh, uh, so there are various connections as uh, and that's a good question how does predatory pricing work in auction well as i said uh, if the uh, uh, if the auctions uh, uh, re uh, result in very very few firms uh, holding uh, all the rights to coal mining or to oil drilling etc then the industry structure becomes very uh, uh, one or two firms only playing a role and you need competition among firms for predatory pricing to not emerge right predatory pricing can 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 then emerge when you know firms try to sort of drive out the remaining competition etc cetera, etc cetera. so as long as there are four or five solid uh, firms with good capitalization uh, you would not see predatory pricing emerge so predatory pricing cannot sort of work in auctions as much as uh, after auctions during auctions it can be that you sort of try to reduce the budget of the other person if you know that they are a small bidder and you take the bids to a very high limit so that they spend a lot of their budget and then uh, don't have enough money left for for future rounds uh, so that can work but it's a little harder to do in auctions mm -hmm. so there is gustavo who's asking what are the current problems that auction theory is not able to solve many problems right so auctions uh, still haven't figured, they haven't this uh, the, the problem of complementarity what if you know territory a and territory b together mean more to me than territory a separately plus territory b separately right so when there's a complementarity uh, uh, a and b together give me much more money then how do you solve for optimal bidding how should you bid optimally how should you sell optimally these questions are very tough they theoretically if you start to write down the problems it's very tough to 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 handle when there's some common value component as well so these are some of the open problems of complementarities among the products being sold how to bid for them uh, still not solved but they are very very tough and i think uh, if one is able to solve them then maybe some years later you're going to be win a, winning a nobel prize as well uh, so uh, uh, those are some of the leading ones uh, sarthak has been asked who first introduced auction theory it's really old i have Uh, i have really i've seen um, uh, uh, i've seen uh, uh, examples of one goethe one of the one poet uh, uh, in europe using some kind of a second price auction to get money for his poem uh, so uh, so uh, the the examples are you know as far as i don't know the, i read somewhere it's really really the historically it's uh, really really old So basically, as I said, when something is hard to sell, uh, uh, right? You are selling just one unit, two units. You can't just uh, uh, how do you sell it? So the auction becomes a very simple answer to get the maximum value for it. Uh, so I think, yeah, the documented auction since 18th century, uh, but theoretically, who started analyzing it? Again, I'm not very clear. But as I said, William Vickery made the first like huge major contributions in testing which. what about these four auction formats turned out they're all the same 
then a lot of literature actually try to understand why are they all the same their rules are so different why are the expected revenue for the auction year the same why is the efficiency the same so that literature was in 1981 myerson and uh, <clears throat> and uh, riley and samuelson and, and and so that really helped us uh, move along and then came uh, milgram and wilson uh, with their huge contributions as well uh, safi is asking if all the four different types of auctions have the same outcome why not have only one type why have different types uh, so uh, there are so the outcome is the same but there are some some differences right so in the second prize auction uh, you are revealing as i said it's best for you to bid your true value so you just reveal your true value to the auctioneer and so this happened in new zealand i think that they used these uh, second prize auctions and then uh, uh, so uh, they 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 saw that the highest bidder had bid hundreds of thousands of dollars and the second highest bid was something like 50 dollars 80 dollars and this was all public knowledge and so the entire public came to know that uh, uh, the bidder valued it at hundreds of thousands of dollars and got it for 100 dollars or something right so the entire public came to know this gap that that the profit that the firm had made so uh, there are various interesting differences uh, and so for example in second price you are supposed to bid your true value same in english auction when you're just raising your hand and crying out and raising your hand until the the price reaches your value but it's very much easier to see it in an english auction for a bidder to realize that i should just keep my hand until the price reaches my value and not beyond it it's very simple to see that you should put your hand down once price goes above your value and it's theoretically the same as second price but behaviorally there are differences so there are all these differences in behavior and then what happens when some people are risk averse uh like they don't want to take the risk of losing the auction or losing money there are then differences start to emerge so under so vikri also analyzed and myerson analyzed conditions under which they are the same so i should not uh, you should not go away thinking that they're exactly the same differences emerge but under various assumptions uh, uh, the differences go away so uh, and behaviorally there are differences so uh, there are all these uh, nuances once you get into it that's why I mean, forty, forty, forty-five minutes is very little time to discuss this, but it's a very interesting topic. Uh, do you have a couple of more minutes, or would you have? Uh, I have to. I have to leave now. I have my class is waiting for me. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Subrajit. I'll just answer your question uh, because that is a generic question on the Nobel Prizes. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Rampal. It's been wonderful, uh, and everyone has been commenting on how you explained so well. and uh, you know so and this is the this was the idea behind bakul talks that you know you have the best of experts so someone uh, who has done a lot of research so all very you know difficult questions also he could answer so so, so simply uh, but then to many of us who do not have a background and it was wonderful you know that we have children from class 6 asking such beautiful questions yes, uh, yes. and so following what is happening one thing i would add is that for in milgram's 2004 book the first chapter is actually completely readable for lay readers and he actually shows what how much of a difference their spectrum design have made has made and like what, what was the situation beforehand so i encourage you all to read that uh, thank you thank you okay. very much dr ramji we'll just continue i'll just make some announcements but thank you very much for joining us and uh, subrajit to answer your question the nobel prize in economics was not there in alfred nobel's will you know so when he made his will and we have talked about it but just i'll repeat it there's an interesting story behind it you know he is alfred nobel uh, who established the nobel prizes uh, with his own money 94% of his money uh, he was actually known for inventing dynamite you know which is used as an explosive he was the owner of uh, the bofors company so by mistake his brother died and while he was traveling and a local newspaper published uh, thinking that alfred nobel had died and said the merchant of death has died and when alfred nobel read this he was shocked he said am i being called a merchant of death and then he had a major change you know as someone said like ashoka had in calling in the kalinga war something like that and he decided to give all his money to establish the nobel prizes 
but the Nobel Prizes did not at that time include the prize in economic sciences. So it included physics, chemistry, peace, literature, uh, and what do we have? Uh, medicine, but it did not have economics. But in the in 1968, you know, 300 years of the Swedish National Bank, the Reichsbank, they decided to establish uh, a prize in memory of Alfred Nobel. So there's always uh, often a debate about whether we can call the economics Nobel as a Nobel Prize or it's a prize in memory of Alfred Nobel, but it is given as part of the Nobel Prizes. And that is why they say in memory of Alfred Nobel, the first year was 1969. So uh, that's about the Nobel Prizes. We will be back next Tuesday with another Nobel Prize discussion. And this time it is going to be the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And the person we have is a very distinguished person again, Professor Jyotir Mai Dash, who recently got the Bhatnagar Award, which is the highest award for scientific achievement given in India. And Jyotir Mai Dash comes from the same institute. You know, if you heard the physics lecture, you would have heard about the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, which C. V. Raman accidentally went to, and his scientific journey in a way that led to the Nobel Prize started there. So she, which is the first research institute for science in India, modern science. And Professor Jyotir Mai Dash is a professor there. So she will be speaking next time. We follow that up with the Literature Prize, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Again, we have one of the finest poets in India, Ranjit Oskote, who will be speaking. And then the last is on the Medicine Prize. We have Dr. Sujata Kar uh, of the Kara Hospital in Bhubaneswar. Again, a very distinguished uh, and eminent doctor and someone who makes it very simple. So our, our experts are not just experts in the domains, but are also experts in communicating to a general audience. But before I sign off, you know, I would just like to inform you that you know, there's Diwali coming up. And as I said, uh, uh, we have storytelling that day. It being Children's Day at 4 p.m., not 9 p.m. But we are also running a campaign. You know, Bakul uh, is a movement of volunteers. And we have a campaign where we are promoting the gifting of plants. And we say, if in Diwali you're gifting a plant, you know, giving a gift, why not gift a plant? And it is all the more important in Diwali. You know, we've all heard the discussion about the threat of COVID increasing in winter. And I'm sure all of you know that the threat of respiratory diseases and COVID is called SARS-CoV-2. You know, SARS as in severe acute respiratory syndrome. Respiratory diseases increase in winter because your suspended pollutants, you know, the pollutants remain suspended for longer and the trees have shed their leaves. So, and there's been a lot of research that links, you know, the greenery around you with um, reduction in respiratory diseases. So if we care about people, if we do not want people to be vulnerable to COVID, then I think the best thing we can do is gift a plant. Gift a plant, you know, it could be a plant like these. So if you want to gift plants, you can of course buy it from the market and package them. But Bakul has also started packaged gift plants. So you can see some options here. And there's a complimentary hamper with handmade diyas and handmade chocolates. So an attractive basket and fabric packaging. You can have flowering plants. You can have medicinal plants or plants that can grow big into trees. Even tabletop plants, you know, something you can put on your desk or inside. Because the more plants, the greenery you have around you, you know, it may not do... A tabletop plant may not do too much for climate change, but it definitely does something for your health. So we need healthy lungs and for healthy lungs, we need more oxygen. So air purifiers of any kind. So plants all around us. So whether you take from Bakul or not, I would urge you to have plants around you and to gift plants whenever you're giving them. And if you want to take it from Bakul, if you like these options, you can always contact us. So the email is contactbakul at gmail.com. You can contact us there or you can call us at 977-8686786. So you can call us at 977-8686786 or you can email us at contactbakul at gmail.com if you are looking for package gift plants like the ones that I showed. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. And if you are interested, of course, 
in listening to stories, listening to the Indonesian Ramayan this Saturday at 4 p.m. And Robi Bar Gopu Bar, Sunday's regular time at 9 p.m. Thank you very much. Bye bye. You know, in education that we are trying to promote reading. As statistics say, 50% children in grade 5 cannot read the textbook of grade 2, then what is really happening? That's because the basic skills of reading and writing is not there. So we thought that if we have to change this cynicism, then we need to demonstrate what is possible with small contributions. So that is the idea basically that Bakul is trying to demonstrate what is possible entirely with volunteerism, entirely with small little contributions. We asked people to contribute uh, books to set up a public library in Bhubaneswar and a children's library was set up in uh, Bhubaneswar and now that children's library has become a general library, a public library with more than 20,000 books. So that is one of the major things. Another major area of intervention is environment. A lot of environmental education but through films and through creative methods. So we have a traveling film festival on environment. We go to schools, colleges, apartments and screen films on environment primarily on climate change and on issues of water and sanitation, two issues that we're working in. And at the libraries also, uh, we conduct a lot of workshops on creativity. You know, we all want uh, the world to be a better place and we have our own ideas of how it can be better. The thing is, can we all start in some small way towards addressing that? Can we say that in some small way, this world is the way I want it to be because I have done something about it.